Hello, and welcome to Lesson 8. Um, in Lesson 8, we're going to take a look at the sky and study the stars. And when you look at the sky, there's almost an infinite number of stars there, and you see almost an infinite variety of the stars. You'll see stars of almost every color and many, many different sizes. And we wonder, how can we understand this wide variety of stars? Well, as it turns out, there's only a few properties among the stars that really determine um, what kind of light we receive from them. And looking at this light, we're able to categorize the stars, and they fall into some very nice, neat groups. So that's what we're going to do in this lesson, is learn how to categorize the stars, how to put them into groups, and how to understand what's going on with the stars in the sky. So in this lesson, we want to classify the stars and learn how we can understand um, all the different things that we see in the sky. And as it turns out, the one thing um, that is important is the properties of the stars. And there's just a few stellar properties that we need to know to classify the star. The three important ones that we'll look at are luminosity, temperature, and mass. And if I can understand luminosity, temperature, and mass of a star, I can learn quite a bit about what that star is doing and its life. So what is luminosity? Luminosity is the total power which is radiated by a star. Remember, power has the units of joules per second or watts. So the total power coming from a star is in watts. And when I look at the sky, um, I see stars of different brightness. So we have an apparent brightness. And the apparent brightness is how bright the star looks to me. So that's how bright the star is when I'm here on Earth. And so the units there are watts per square meter. So here, if you have an image of a star, you can see that the energy being produced by that star is going out in all directions. If I'm just in one little location, say the square in this diagram, I only get a small part of that light. And also, the further away that square is, the less of the light I get. The total light coming off the star would be its luminosity. The amount of light I see in my little square would be the apparent brightness. And just like a light bulb, if I was to turn on a 100 watt, 100 watt light bulb right in front of your face, it'd be very bright. But if I walked it across the street and through a park and turned it on, it would not be very bright at all. And there's a simple relationship that relates the distance away to that brightness, and it's called the inverse square law. So the inverse square law says that the amount of light I see, the apparent brightness, is related to the luminosity and the distance between the source and the observer. So the apparent brightness, we find, is equal to the star's luminosity divided by the surface area of a sphere at your radius. So all of the light produced in the star is shining on the surface area of that sphere, and you are just seeing a little piece of it. So in symbols, I can say the apparent brightness is the luminosity L divided by the surface area of the sphere, which is 4 pi times the radius squared, or the distance away squared. So when I look at the sky, I see light of many different stars of many different brightnesses. And this luminosity can range over a great, great value. So it ranges everywhere from one ten thousandth that of the sun to a million times the luminosity of the sun. So there's a wide variety of luminosities that we can see in the sky. So in the ancient Greeks, 190 to 120 um, BC, um, they came up a way, with a way to think about these things, and they used a magnitude system. Astronomers today still use a magnitude system, and the magnitude is how bright a star appears to our eyes. And due to this ancient system, the Greeks labeled the brightest stars they could see as a magnitude 1. A star that was a little bit dimmer would be magnitude 2. A star that was dimmer yet would be magnitude 3, and on down the light. So these are apparently how bright the stars are to us. So. Um, today we also use what's called an absolute magnitude, and this would be more related to the luminosity. It tells me the brightness I would see if I was 10 parsecs away from the star, or 32.6 light years from the star. So the absolute magnitude then is the same, um, or is related directly to the luminosity, and it has the same correction for every star that we see. Another important property of these stars is their surface temperature. And when I talk about the stellar temperature of a star, I am talking about the temperature of the surface of that star, the photosphere of that star. We're not talking about the interior temperatures or the temperature of the corona, just the temperature of the surface, because that's what we're able to observe the light from. So that's what we can measure directly. 
and we can, this is easier to measure than luminosity because it doesn't depend how far away the star is. So we find that the color and the temperature are related. Just like looking at a fire, um, you're going to find that the red coals are not as hot as the blue coals or the blue flame, and the white flame is even hotter yet. So the color that you observe tells you something about the temperature. And we can be more precise because we know that the surface of a star is a black body radiator. And so the spectrum we get from the star is a black body spectrum. So when I look at the black body spectrum, the shape and location of the peak can tell me the temperature of the surface. So looking at this plot, I can see that I can have a wide range of temperatures and if I get a temperature of a star that's, say, 10,000 degrees Kelvin at the surface, I'm going to get a lot of ultraviolet light, um, a little bit of the visible light. Um, if I have a star that is 1,000 degrees Kelvin, I'm going to get a lot of infrared light and a little bit of the visible light. So looking at this, you can see that the sun peaks at around 5,800 Kelvin, and that's in the visible range, so we get a lot of visible light from our sun. But by measuring the spectrum, then, I'm able to deduce the temperature of the surface of the star. Another way we can do this is using spectral lines. We know that we have an absorption line from the atmosphere in the upper parts of the photosphere, um, which are cooler than the lower parts. And if I get a set of spectral lines that are spectral lines of highly ionized elements, I know the star has to be very hot because it requires a lot of heat to ionize the elements. If I see spectral lines from molecules, the star is not going to be as hot because molecules have not yet been ripped apart into their component elements, so that's going to be a much cooler star. And this was first studied in the 19th century, and a lot of the work was done by a group of women at Harvard College, and this group of women were called the calculators, and were very helpful in developing this field of astronomy. And they've categorized the stars by their spectral lines, and after a first attempt, which rated them from A through O, um, they came and refined their calculations and found that the stars, each one categorized by temperature, goes from hottest to coldest, O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. So here, each of those represents a different set of spectral lines and a different temperature star. This couple acronyms for remembering this. Um, the most common one would be OB, a fine girl, kiss me, is a good way to remember those ordering of the temperatures. And this was done by the Harvard calculators. Annie Jump Cannon was the one that actually figured out the final um, sequence of the letters. So another important property of the star is its mass. So how are we going to measure the mass of the star? Well, we're going to use binary stars. As it turns out, almost half of the stars in the sky are binaries. So that gives us a lot of stars to study. And there are three types of binaries. There's going to be a visual binary, an eclipsing binary, and a spectroscopic binary. The visual binary is a set of stars that are orbiting each other. And they're orbiting each other in a way that we can observe the orbits of the stars. Um, this is an image of a visual binary. You see the large, bright star in the center and a smaller, dimmer star orbiting around it. Um, we can, this way, directly measure the period of the rotation. And from that, we'll be, find, we'll be able to find the um, mass. Another type of binary is an eclipsing binary. And here, we can measure periodic eclipses. So if we look at eclipse and binaries, one star passes between us and the other star. And when the small star is in front of the brighter star, it dims. And we get a small dip in our brightness. And then when it passes behind the large bright star, we get a second small dip in the brightness because we're not seeing both stars. And this characteristic double dip repeats itself in time. And from that, we're able to measure a period of rotation. So the third type is the spectroscopic binary. And here we use Doppler shifts to understand the 
binary system. As two stars orbit us, um, I see my eye down at the bottom of this diagram. As one star is moving towards us in the orbit, it is red shifted as the, or blue shifted, and the one moving away from us is slightly red shifted. So we can see the spectral lines moving back and forth. We can see one star's spectral lines being red shifted while the others are being blue shifted. And by watching this periodic motion in the spectrum, we're able to measure the period of the motion. Well, you may be asking yourself, we want to understand the mass. Why am I interested in measuring the period of the motion? Well, we're going to use Newton's version of Kepler's third law. So here, recall that we have the period squared is 4 pi squared over the gravitational constant times the masses squared times the separation cubed. So here I have, if I can measure the period, I can measure the mass or the separation. I need two of the three of the variables to get the one I don't know. So if I can measure the period and the separation, I'm able to calculate the mass. So here then, if we can measure either of those three things, remember that as I'm watching these, I can measure the velocity of the orbiting star. And if that orbiting star is orbiting in a circle, then the speed that it orbits is the radius of the circle divided by the period, or the time it takes to go around the circle, so the distance per time. And if we want to know the average separation, we can rearrange that and measure the speed times the period divided by 2 pi gives us the average separation. We can use that separation in Newton's version of Kepler's third law, and along with the period, and solve for the mass of the system. So this is a very nice way to solve for the mass of a star. So stars vary greatly in mass, not as greatly as the luminosity. Um, the most massive stars, and we'll find out why there's a limit on the mass of a star, um, is 100 times the mass of our sun. And the least massive stars that we observe are only 0 0.08 or 8% the mass of our sun. So the next thing we're going to want to do is start to categorize. We're going to start to take the stars and put them into groups and see what kind of patterns we can find from these groups using Russell Hurst.